Welcome to Mehdi Unfiltered here in Washington, D.C. I'm Mehdi Hassan. On today's show, I speak to former Palestinian negotiator Diana Butu on what could be the largest protest in Israel's history. But first, we must address the elephant and donkey in the room and talk about the presidential debate this week. I'll be giving my take on what went down in Philadelphia. Plus, I'll be joined by New York Congressman Jamal Bowman on what was a very different debate for the Democrats this time around with a lot more pet talk. Plus... Whatever happened to Jamal Bowman and his primary? And APAC, lots to discuss. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> Ranting, raving, lying, deflecting. Donald Trump was at his very worst on the Philadelphia debate stage on Tuesday night. If Joe Biden's debate performance in June, embarrassingly incoherent, was considered to be the worst presidential debate performance ever and forced him to step down from the race, then surely Donald Trump's debate performance on Tuesday night, not just embarrassingly incoherent, but shamelessly dishonest and unconnected from reality, should force him to step down from the race too. But no, that'll never happen. Number one, because Trump is shameless. Number two, his party is full of cowards. They don't have a Nancy Pelosi to push him out. And number three, our media continues to grade him on a curve. Yes, the New York Times on Wednesday morning on its homepage summarized the debate as, in fierce debate, Harris baits a defensive Trump. Not just defensive Trump, dishonest Trump, deluded Trump, deranged Trump. But they'll never say that. The debate was more than an hour and a half long on ABC, and pretty much every pundit, focus group, Insta poll agrees that Harris won and Trump lost. Even Trump's loyalists know he lost because they're busy being snowflakes, whining and complaining that the moderators were biased. Winners don't complain about the moderators. But what do we actually learn of value, of importance from this debate? Here are five things I think we learned that mattered. Number one, Donald Trump is unfit for high office, for any office. He didn't just lie shamelessly, brazenly, repeatedly. For example, in this exchange on COVID... We had the greatest economy. We got hit with a pandemic. And the pandemic was not since 1917, where 100 million people died. Has there been anything like it? We did a phenomenal job with the pandemic. We handed them over a country where the economy and where the stock market was higher than it was before the pandemic came in. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. We made ventilators for the entire world. We got gowns. We got masks. We did things that nobody thought possible. And people give me credit for rebuilding the military. They give me credit for a lot of things, but not enough credit for the great job we did with the pandemic. To be clear, his leadership during the pandemic was perhaps the worst in the world. He suggested people put disinfectant in their arms. And he may have sent ventilators abroad, but he didn't have enough here at home. As for gowns, doctors and nurses in America had to wear trash bags while bodies piled up in New York streets. But he didn't just lie shamelessly about things like COVID. He also engaged in the worst, most racist, most deranged conspiracy theories. What they have done to our country by allowing these millions and millions of people to come into our country and look at what's happening to the towns all over the United States. And a lot of towns don't want to talk. It's not going to be Aurora or Springfield. A lot of towns don't want to talk about it because they're so embarrassed by it. In Springfield... They're eating the dogs, the people that came in. They're eating the cats. They're eating, they're eating the pets of the people that live there. And this is what's happening in our country, and it's a shame. Yes, in 2024, the Republican nominee for president of the United States, lathered in bronzer, stood up on a live television debate stage and shouted about migrants eating your pets. They might as well just have nominated Alex Jones to be their candidate or a another internet troll. Number two, it's too easy to bait Donald Trump. Just too easy. People like me said Harris should bait Trump. The Harris team briefed NBC News the week before the debate that they planned to bait Trump. And Trump's people told Trump not to get baited. But the thin-skinned man-child that he is, he just couldn't stop himself. He took the bait every time. I'm going to actually do something really unusual, and I'm going to invite you to attend one of Donald Trump's rallies, because it's a really interesting thing to watch. You will see during the course of his rallies, he talks about fictional characters like Hannibal Lecter. He will talk about windmills cause cancer. And what you will also notice is that people start leaving his rallies early out of exhaustion and boredom. And I will tell you, the one thing you will not hear him talk about is you. You will not hear him talk about your needs, your dreams, and your, need, and your desires. 
And I'll tell you, I believe you deserve a president who actually puts you first, and I pledge to you that I will. It's that Harris ding of his rallies that provoked the orange narcissist to make his crazy claim about migrants eating pets. Yes, his response to Harris saying he says crazy stuff at his rallies was to say crazy stuff at the debate. Stable genius. He's a stable genius. Number three, you can fact check Donald Trump in a debate. We were told it couldn't be done. It was against the rules. Trump is too hard to stop in his tracks. Not true. On Tuesday, ABC News moderators David Muir and Lindsey Davis on multiple occasions stepped in to fact-check Trump's lies about Democrats killing babies after they're born or immigrants eating cats in Springfield, Ohio, or whether or not Trump won or lost the 2020 election. Spoiler alert, he lost. So American journalists, stop making excuses. Fact-check Trump every time. Oh, and for the people on the right saying, well, why did they only fact-check Trump? because Trump was the only one telling dozens and dozens of demonstrable, ridiculous lies. Number four, Trump doesn't know anything. He can't talk about policy. His rants about tariffs, about other countries supposedly paying for tariffs, they don't, we do, exposed him as a liar and an ignoramus. And when he was asked about his position on health care, on replacing Obamacare, which he has been promising a plan on for years now, but never revealing one, this is what happened. I had a choice to make. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be, or do I let it rot? And I saved it. I did the right thing. But it's still never going to be great, and it's too expensive for people. And what we will do is we're looking at different plans. If we can come up with a plan that's going to cost our people, our population, less money and be better health care than Obamacare, then I would absolutely do it. But until then, I'd run it as good as it can be run. So just a yes or no, you still do not have a plan. I have concepts of a plan. I have the concepts of a plan. You can't make this shit up. So surely you can't put a village idiot like Donald Trump in charge of a school board, let alone the US federal government and, you know, the nuclear codes. And number five. Sadly, neither of our two parties give a damn about Palestinian lives and nor does our media. The section on Gaza at the debate was belated, brief, and filled with lazy, canned talking points from both candidates. Harris saying, two-state solution. Trump saying, Iran's to blame. It even turned into a competition about who loves Israel more. She hates Israel. If she's president, I believe that Israel will not exist within two years from now. And I've been pretty good at predictions, and I hope I'm wrong about that one. She hates Israel. At the same time, in her own way, she hates the Arab population because the whole place is going to get blown up. Arabs, Jewish people, Israel. Israel will be gone. Vice President Harris, he says you hate Israel. Uh, oh, that's absolutely not true. I have my entire career and life supported Israel and the Israeli people. He knows that. He's trying to, again, divide and, and distract from the reality. You might think the moderators, who had done a pretty decent job up until then, might have asked about the American citizen who was just killed in the occupied West Bank by US armed Israeli forces. But they didn't. You might think the two candidates might have something to say about that. They didn't. When it comes to Gaza and presidential debates, I can't help but think of that old Noam Chomsky quote. The smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to strictly limit the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum. Well, we certainly had a lively debate, and Trump certainly lost that debate. But will he lose the election? Not necessarily. In any other country, the media would demand he stand down after last night. His party would push for him to stand down. His voters would be abandoning him in droves. But not in America in 2024. It just doesn't matter. And that is the single biggest tragedy of our current dark political moment. Joining me now from the great state of New York, Congressman Jamal Bowman, who is a progressive Democrat, member of the squad, um, a supporter, I think it's fair to say, of Kamala Harris, but a progressive yes. supporter of Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman also rather famously lost his seat, sadly, in the primary early the summer after AIPAC dumped, I think, over $14 million in that race. Oh, yeah, way more than that. All right, yes. well, we're going to talk <laughs> about the race. Let's start with the debate. 
Mm -hmm. Big moment of the week. What what was your reaction? Did you watch Harris Trump? It was very different uh, uh, to uh, Trump Biden. I think it's fair to very say. Very different. Uh, Trump is a scary embarrassment uh, to himself and yes. to everything uh, the Republican Party currently represents. I mean, he's talking about eating cats and dogs and uh, you know all kinds of stuff. You know, never tells the truth, always misleads. So I thought he got crushed in the debate, and I, and I think, you know, the VP left a lot on the table. She could have called him out on his yes. trillion-dollar tax cuts. She could yeah. have called him out on so many other issues, but I think she still clearly uh, won the debate. Uh, more about less substance and policy than I wanted to hear about. I wanted to hear more about, you know, the child tax credit. I wanted to hear more about, like, kind of her vision for, you know, a progressive America going mm. forward. Um, didn't hear enough about that, but overall, I think she won. And, Difficult to do yeah. that in a debate because they've got to ask the same question to both. And Trump yeah. knows nothing about policy. Yeah, like knows. when he was asked one simple <laughs> policy question, what will you replace Obamacare with? Oh, man. I mean, he could not answer yeah. uh, the question. Um, uh, so, you know, he's got the. It was just embarrassing yeah. to see him talk. Um, part of me was shouting at the television, saying, you know, when they asked about like NATO and he said Houthis, like, Ask him what a Houthi is. <laughs> ask him what NATO stands for. Like basic. F I would love to see one day an interview with Trump where you just ask basic mm -hmm. fat questions. Yeah, I know, but it's what's the capital of Rwanda? Uh, but it's scary because this guy was president, yes. right? And the polling is neck and neck, could and he be could again. be president again, even though he ended with an insurrection. He's indicted, convicted, and he's older, dumber, and more older, incoherent yeah, than he was. Yeah, and talking about eating cats years. and dogs, and so it, it's it's scary. And I hope that, you know, the VP wins and it brings a, uh, an opportunity for fresh thinking, a paradigm shift, and really pushing on the policies that we've left on the table for quite some time. There was criticism from the media, some of it, I think, in bad faith, that we don't have... Um we don't have enough policies coming from Kamala Harris. And then mm -hmm. she published a policy plan, and people are like, oh, it's Joe Biden's plan that's just been re redone. I mean, put aside the bad faith media criticisms, because, yeah. you know, Hillary Clinton had loads of policies, didn't help her with the media. Yeah. Uh, what, from a progressive good faith point of view, would you want her to be talking about? You mentioned child tax credit. What else would oh. you like to have seen from her last night or in her interview with CNN? I don't know if she's doing any more interviews. She hasn't done many. I mean, we, we can double down on the child tax credit, right? Making the child tax credit permanent, permanent, permanent will we'll lift 50% of children out of poverty. That will be transformational for those children, for those families, for our education system, for our economy. You know, my background is education, so yes. I'm very biased in that space. So that's one area. She spoke about affordable housing and, and her plan a little bit to build affordable housing. I want to hear more about that, talk about the need, talk about uh, Wall Street predators in the affordable housing space and the problem with that, and talk about, you know, corporate, corporate taxes and taxes on the wealthy and make sure they contribute their fair share. Yes, a lot of this is Biden, but a lot of this has been part of the Democratic platform for quite some time. We just haven't done enough in the in the House or the Senate to implement it. Certainly, in the Senate, Joe mentioned was a block on the child tax credit. Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know he he you know that will be the first line of his obit. He helped push 50% of American children into poverty. I think that's fair to say. That's right. Uh, and he'll never live that down. Uh, let me talk to you about um, one issue that came up at the well. Immigration was hanging over the entire debate. And what Harris did so well, I thought, at the beginning, which is the best way to stop people like Trump, who are propagandists, which is she identified, right at the start, she said, this is what he's going to do all night. Mm -hmm. Whatever you ask him, he's going to bring it back to immigration. And he then ex did exactly that. That's right. But then when they got to the actual bespoke immigration segment, she had her talking point, which is, we had this bipartisan bill that Joe Biden signed off on with James Lankford, Republican senator yep, from yep. Oklahoma. And Republicans stopped it because Trump told them to. And it's a, it's a good talking point. It makes mm -hmm. sense. But take out Trump and the Republicans. The bill itself was a horrific bill, <laughs> was it not? Am I right in it saying that? It was not a bill that progressives supported. Draconian. It, it, yes. it gave a future president, including a Trump, the right to basically shut down the border, end asylum, well, legal asylum. This has been part of my frustration with being in Congress. It, seemed like, it seems like whenever we do or try to do a transformative piece of legislation, it has to include something like a thousand more police yes. or another billion to Israel or tax cuts for corporations. You know, we gave corporations tens of billions of dollars in tax cuts and lifted a few children out of poverty. That's how this place has worked. That's how it definitely works under Republicans. But Democrats have to do better if we get back in there and get power. But yes, it was not a bill that progressives supported by and large. It would be nice if a Democratic leader, presidential candidate, um, spokesperson, especially the vice president who's running for election, running for the White House, is the child of immigrants, could actually make a positive case, unashamed, not defensive, just a case for why 
immigration is a good thing, why migrants are net contributors, mm -hmm. rather than always accepting the Republican framing that it's a problem, they're a threat, we need to crack down. Yeah, it would be, that would be nice, it would be refreshing, it would be truthful and accurate. <laughs> uh, we can talk about our impact in Central and South America over the years that has contributed to mass migration. We can talk about the impact of climate change or yeah. mass migration, not just here, but all over the world. Uh, we could talk about the need for more social services uh, at the border, more legal representation, more social workers to help streamline the process. But we don't do that. We get defensive, right? And, and, and again, that was last night. That's generally the case. My hope is, and I'm always a hopeful guy, going forward post-election she wins, all of us now have a responsibility to help facilitate new conversations and new thinking and new ideas. We cannot be the same old America. Well, one place we need some new thinking and new ideas, I think it's fair to say, is our Middle East policy, which yeah. is the same old, same old. Decades and decades of bipartisan uh, support for Israel, no matter what, even when they're killing American citizens, as they've just done. Yeah. No mention at the debate last night of an American citizen killed, gunned down by the IDF, mm -hmm. and by the Israeli military. Um, what did you make of the Israel segment of the debate, where they basically ended up arguing over who likes Israel more? <laughs> it's... Uh... Another thing that's been uh, very frustrating for me uh, while I've been here in Congress, um, there, there's nothing wrong with good faith criticism of your friend in any context, yep. right? So Israel's an ally, they're our friend in the Middle East, we support their right to exist, all that stuff, right? And we need to end the occupation, end settlement expansion, hold them accountable, stop detaining children, and right now stop the genocide and the killing of babies and innocent people. We can say those things. We can also say, if you continue, we will not send you any more arms. Yeah. And guess what? You know what they're going to do? They're going to stop killing babies, yes. right? And so I've been, especially this past year, like just blown away by just the unequivocal support, no matter what. It's almost like a complete erasure of the Palestinian people. It's definitely a dehumanization, but it's a complete erasure. And so we have to be able to think out of both sides of our brain and, and walk and chew gum at the same time and center the conversations on human rights. The problem is, and the challenge is, as you know, APAC and lobbies like APAC have so much power and control over our government, and that maintains the problem. So before we come to APAC and your own race, just on Harris-Trump, if you are a progressive, you are a young person, you are a person of color who cares about foreign people, you are a Palestinian American, a Muslim American, Arab American, especially in somewhere like Michigan, mm -hmm. and you watched last night's debate, and you saw Harris and Trump argue over who loves Israel more, and no one's saying they're going to hold Israel to account or stop the genocide. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that person who says, Congressman, why would I vote for either of them? They're both equally bad on this subject. Yeah. First, I would say I understand completely, uh, because you have been made to feel invisible and have been erased, so I understand. What I would nudge a little bit on is I think we can move things more in a positive direction with a, with a President Harris than we can a President Trump. Uh, I'm pretty, I feel pretty strongly about that. I mean, even her rhetoric at her, when she accepted the nomination at the uh, convention, was different than we would ever hear Trump say about Palestinians and ceasefire and all of that, different than what we've heard President Biden say. She was the first to say ceasefire. Now, right now, it's rhetoric. Yeah, but that rhetoric came from the uh, uncommitted movement, people like me and others who have been screaming yeah. from the mountaintops about this issue. So rhetoric is often the first step. When she gets in, God willing, I hope she does, we have to continue to fight and push her and all of Congress and in state houses and county and locally. Because in my race, and I know we're going to get to that, after October 7th, the governor, the county executive, all the mayors, they immediately erased everything Netanyahu and, and uh, all of the leaders in Israel were saying about Amalek and using white phosphorus and cutting off electricity. Well, they ignored all that to stand with Israel. And so this is a national, deeply entrenched problem over decades. And it's going to take us fighting for the rest of our lives to get on the other side of this, of this and it's not going to happen because of someone's goodwill. They're going to have to be forced through, through our organization. So let's talk about your race. 
you lost, uh, I think, by 17 points. Something like that. Against George Latimer, who was mm -hmm. your opponent, who took a very strongly pro-Israel stance. Yes. Not just a strongly pro-Israel stance, suggested he and his allies suggested you were not just anti-Israel, but anti-Semitic. Yep. Um, I think you tell me, I've read numbers of $14, $15 million that went Yo, into more your than that, yeah. district from APAC, like more than goes into other countries' entire elections. Yeah, well, the most... spent in one district in the Bronx. Yeah, more, more spent in, than any other race in history in a district that covers uh, the Northeast Bronx and Southern Westchester County. And how much do you believe that money played a role in defeating you? A huge role, um, because they were able to bombard the district with uh, ads, constant ads, digital, uh, cable and TV, bombard the district with um, with uh, mailers. I mean, the mailers were crazy. I would come home and be 15 mailers in the box, 10 would be answered. But they weren't really mentioning Israel either. They were criticizing you from other... From another, they they <laughs> quietly didn't mention the Israel, they, but they said you're against Biden, you're against the Correct, correct. So, so, so this was the, um, you know, APAC, DMFI, and UDPs. Yes, the United know. Democracy Project, which that's is their right, pack. That's right, that's right. So the money helps them to, to send the mailers and have the ads, but it also helps them to organize on the ground. It also helps them to be more data-driven in how they make decisions in their race. So the money's a big part. Another big part that doesn't often get talked about, when we first beat, now remember, we beat Elliot Engel. He was yeah. like the number one pro-Israel Zionist hawk in Washington. When we first beat him, they had their eye out for us then. And during the first redistricting process, they took 180,000 black people out the district. And so a district that was majority black for 30 years all of a sudden gets its first black rep and now it's no longer majority black. And it, it no longer has the entire North Bronx, it has a small piece of it, right, and more in Westchester. So it was a combination of the money, it was a combination of the redistricting, it was a candidate that people in Westchester especially knew and liked very much. He was a much. popular local guy. Yeah, popular local guy. What do you think and, you got wrong? Well, last thing I want to say is, and it's a very pro-Israel district. Right? It's not like a district in the middle of nowhere with not, with not that many, you know, yeah. APAC people. It was APAC central for the most part. What we could have done better is we could have been, and this is why I'm saying we have to do this work for the rest of our lives, you need to organize day to day in historically marginalized communities to engage people in the political process. So don't wait till you have a challenger in this election season. You have to be engaging people day to day. And it's not just engaging them in getting more involved in the political process, it's engaging them in what's happening in your lives and how can I be more helpful? How can I do, want to help you get a good job, a better job, more money in your pocket? How am I engaging mm. you in dealing with issues of uh, your child's education or health care? It needs to be a holistic, data-driven, organizing approach that happens every day in order for us to build power. And even that's not enough without us building the infrastructure that we need to beat the apex of the world or the fossil fuel lobby or whatever it is that we're fighting against. Yeah, it's very important to point out there are multiple lobbies at play here. Yeah. Say, oh, you're picking on the pro-Israel lobby. Yeah, no, so it's the gun lobby, <laughs> it's the oil lobby, they're all the same. Yes, and they all want progressives out. Yes. I mean, there was some lobby that came into the district uh, that was an African-American lobby that was anti-Bowman, and they were driving around the Bronx in a big, like, truck with my face on it, uh, telling everybody how I'm this horrible guy. And I sub it, it, the, the ad was something like, you know, I, I'm not fighting hard enough to keep guns off the street. I'm like, what, are you kidding me? That's one of my number one issues. So it, there's an infrastructure in place Do to keep them in power. I read somewhere that after October the 7th, um, a lot of the local Jewish communities turned on you. You were disinvited from synagogues. Rabbis yeah. came out to endorse against you. They accuse you of anti-Semitism. Number one, how does that make you feel? Number two, what is your response to people who make this claim that people like yourself or Rashida Tlaib or other progressives are quite anti-Semitic? Yes, it's, uh, it, 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 it almost doesn't even warrant a response because it's so ridiculous. Um, when we fight for human rights, we fight for the human rights of all people. Um, we don't, we're not fighting against one group of people uh, because of their race or faith. That is just, that's just completely ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't surprising when the rabbis like organized a letter encouraging my opponent to run against me. It wasn't surprising when I was disinvited to certain events because I had felt the, um, the vitriol, if you will, when I would go to these events, um, even when I was invited. I, I would feel the, 
Because so, three October the seventh, you'd already criticized Israel quite harshly. Well, after well when we first, what, just one example, you know, when we first came in, I was a co-sponsor on Betty McCullum's bill, just asking for an accounting of our money that goes to Israel, so we can make sure that the money is not used to detain children in, yep. in the West Bank. I was a co-sponsor on that, a bill that wouldn't get a sniff in committee at all. It would never make it to the floor for a vote. But because I co-sponsored that, they bombarded my office, they meaning the APAC lobby, bombarded my office with calls and letters. We couldn't even do our job. So about a week, two weeks, they protested outside the office with the Israel flag in an 80% black neighborhood. Um, so this is what they were doing, right? They felt that I was a threat to their existence because of what Elliot Engel used to It's interesting champion. because Yusuf Munaya, who's a Palestinian-American analyst here in mm -hmm. D.C., he made the point that even though you and Cory Bush, who was defeated after you in her primary, um, with APAC money in that race as well, he made the point that that's actually APAC looking weak, not strong. Mm -hmm. Because in the past, they didn't have to spend so much money yeah. to stop people. It was much easier for them to get their way to silence their critics in Congress. Actually, you and Cory Bush and others in the squad and other progressives like Jayapal, Khanna, whatever it is, have actually moved the conversation in a way where they are petrified. A hundred percent. It's complete desperation on their part that they had to spend that much money. It does show that they're weak. They do not have the intellectual argument. They do not have the moral argument. They do not have the historical argument. Well, the fact they don't mention Israel in their flies. Yeah, they, they and, the because argument. they know, right? But to have, I mean, think about this. You have members, myself included, on the House floor arguing in defense of Rashida Tlaib's right to say from the river to the sea on the House floor. A couple years ago, you had the squad stand up and argue against the apartheid in Israel. You yeah. don't have no one else in Congress doing yeah. things like this, right? And so, uh, because we're fighting for justice, and justice for Palestinians means justice for Israelis, too. It means self-determination and safety for everyone. We continue to lie to ourselves about what's happening there and what we get. We get it on October 7th, and we get a genocide. I got to ask you a question. You're, you're leaving Congress now. Yes. So maybe you're freer to speak about this stuff, but what is it like in the House? In, no, seriously, because people, I, I just, there are a lot of decent Democrats I speak to, House yes. Democrats, oh, yeah. who, you know, you've heard the phrase, PEP, progressive except Palestine. Yeah. You will, they, will, they will be passionate on every issue, child tax credit, child care, um, humanitarian aid abroad, supporting refugees, justice for Ukrainians under fire. Palestine, not oh, a word. No, no, not at all. What is, is it, do they know and they just turn a blind eye? Do they stay willfully ignorant? Is it, quote, unquote, the APAC buddy that uh, Thomas Massey recently mm -hmm. talked about, the Republican, yeah. in an interview? What is it? I think it's all of the above, man. I think it's many of them are probably strong supporters of Israel and have no knowledge of Palestine or the history there. The dehumanization, the, the invisibility. They, 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 they have no knowledge, right? It's like when you learn about European history in schools and no other history. Yeah. So you, 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 right? So I think there's that. I think it's also like, man, I don't want to deal with APAC. Like, I don't want to have to deal with my yep. phones being bombarded and I've protests outside members. my office. And I want to deal with that. And then lastly, I don't want to lose my seat, right? And I don't want to have, you know, tens of millions of dollars spent against me and ads about, and articles about my children. I mean, they wrote about my children. They wrote about my children's school. Like, they, they were show, I had reporters showing up in my home. Like, they don't want to deal with that. And this is when we say, like, special interests in general, but certain special in interests in particular have way too much power in Congress. This is, this is the example of it. So it's, and for me, it's incredibly frustrating. I'm a middle school principal, right? So in my job, you come to work every day to help child A learn how to read or learn how to do math or support family. So it's, a, it's really outcomes driven, right? You help people get from point A to point B. In Congress, man, trying to move something through that place, if it's not focused on police or Israel, big business, it doesn't move. So why, why have we been fighting for 20 years to, to, to lift children out of poverty? Are you kidding me? We couldn't raise the federal minimum wage when I first got to Congress, again, because of Joe Manchin, right? And so it, it's, how does it feel? Incredibly frustrating yeah. to be in a place with so much power, but it's so controlled by special interests. It's interesting about the movement on Israel as an issue. Uh, there was an event a few years back, I'm trying to paraphrase, Pelosi and Schumer at an event, Nancy Pelosi, and they, she made a joke about if Congress burned to the ground, the one thing we, all the party would still agree on is we need to support Israel, uh, which is a bizarre thing for an American politician to say. Uh, one last question for you. Well, a couple of last questions for you. One is, Cori Bush said in her 
kind of farewell address when she lost on the night that APAC, I'm coming for you. She's going to carry on the work of fighting. Are yeah. you part of that fight? Is it APAC? Oh, yeah. Are you, yeah. On, you, you, you still want to fight with them and try and take, well, try and reduce their well, I still want, influence? I still want to fight for justice, right? So yeah. fighting for justice takes a variety of forms. It's electoral politics, but there are other ways to fight for justice. So I plan to still do that. I'm still going to fight for police reform, criminal justice reform, all those other yeah. things. So well, it's interesting that a lot yeah. of Republican donors send money through APAC, which yeah. tells you oh, about it's goodness. not a bipartisan group. Maybe it was at one time. It's I mean, there were anymore. people on camera, like, like confidently saying, I support George Latimer and Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it. <laughs> so last question, then. what do you plan to do next? I don't know. We'll see, man. I'm still, still, still figuring it out. Right now, listen, man, I have, you know, beautiful wife. She's a third grade teacher. She's a single mom when I'm here doing this. So the more I could be in New York supporting her, the better. Shout out to Melissa. Um, I got a son just starting high school and a daughter in fifth grade. Like, let me spend some time with my family Please close do. to home, right? Please do. Then we'll see in a couple of years, right? We'll see what, what the political arena looks like. Um, but, but it's how can we continue to make it? You're not impact? ruling out return to Congress? Not the House. I don't think I'll return to the House. OK. Maybe the Senate. You know, okay. Maybe US Senate, maybe running for governor or running for mayor or something like that. Um, it would have to be a role with much more influence um, because we got we got children dying every day of gun violence. Like mm. I can't I can't sit on that. And we got a genocide going on. Another policy where a special interest has prevented any movement, the NRA. Correct. Which but, we recognize, by the way. But, but, we recognize that the gun lobby yeah. plays a huge role, but we won't recognize the Israel lobby does the same. And the last thing, think about how lost we are as a country. You have a genocide happening in Gaza. And we invite the person committing the genocide during the genocide to come address a joint Democrats session. stayed in the hall to applaud him. Many yeah. left, but many stayed. Yes. That's where we are. That is where we are. Congressman Bowman, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Good to see you. The ongoing genocidal war in occupied Gaza is putting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu under a lot of pressure. Not from the United States and not from his country's diehard allies elsewhere in the world, but his own citizens. Tel Aviv was brought to a standstill over the weekend as more than 750,000 protesters took to the streets around the country, not just in Tel Aviv, calling for a deal that would release the hostages in Gaza exactly 11 months on from the war. These protests, possibly the largest in Israel's history, came after the Israeli army announced last week that it recovered the bodies of six hostages in occupied Gaza that were previously being held by Hamas. Now, it's important to note that these aren't necessarily anti-war protests. And not everyone you see on the streets of Tel Aviv, well, not all of them are calling for an end to the genocide or even an end to the occupation. On the contrary, actually, this billboard was spotted in several locations in Tel Aviv saying, bring back the Israeli hostages, then go back into Gaza. The protesters clearly hate Netanyahu, but they hate him for jeopardizing the lives of Israeli hostages, not necessarily the lives of Palestinians in Gaza. To find out more about the mood on the streets during the protest, I'm joined by Haifa-based lawyer, analyst, and Zateo contributor, Diana Butu, a Palestinian citizen of Israel who was on the ground as protesters marched. Diana, thank you for joining me on Mehdi Unfiltered. Let's start with what you saw and heard while you were at these protests. Obviously, these aren't the first large protests that have taken place demanding a hostage release. What was different about these ones this weekend that got a lot of notice? Thank you, Mehdi. Thanks for having me. I went to two protests, one in Haifa, the city in which I live, and another one just outside of uh, the city of Nazareth called Nahalal. And what's interesting about these protests is the size. But what's also interesting is the fact that Palestinians are completely absent from these protests, meaning that none of the signs, none of the slogans, none of the speeches are ever sp uh, talking about what Israel has done to Palestinians. In fact, we are simply invisible. They're talking about the losses that they have sustained, but there is not at all a reckoning with the genocide. In fact, you don't see the term genocide. You don't see slogans to end uh, even the war. It's simply a question of focusing on the hostages yeah. and retrieving the hostages, but not at all on Palestinians. Palestinians are invisible, but you went along. You were visible. How were you greeted? Did anyone notice you? Did you get in any discussions? Were you welcome? I was there. People did not notice me. And, uh, and But what was very interesting is that there was one man who was carrying what I think he thought was a, a Palestinian flag. It's actually a Sudanese flag. And, uh, and that was it. 
uh, apart from that, you know, they, people didn't know me. They couldn't tell who, who I was. And the conversations that I did get into, and I did get into a few of them, were very much just focused on Israel. It was people are angry about the economy. They're angry about the fact that, uh, that this is continuing. They're angry with Netanyahu. They're angry with the fact that the Haredim are not going to uh, the army, but not yeah, at Orthodox, all yeah. any sort of reckoning with, uh, with with what they've done to Palestinians. In fact, I asked them about it, and it, the the answer was very typical, which is, you know, there's nothing we can do. So is it your contention that if there was a hostage deal and the hostages came out, these people would just go home? Yes, and in fact, uh, they would just go home and then bomb Gaza the very next day. Um, this is the problem, Mahdi, is that the way that Israel was created was through the dehumanization and through creating Palestinians as being invisible. And even now, the, what they're, the way that they're treating Palestinians is through de dehumanizing them and, of course, by making sure that we are invisible. So you don't see a reckoning of saying, we've, we've been committing genocide. Uh, this must end. Instead, it's simply about what has happened to them. So you're 100% right. Let's just talk about the politics of the protests, because a lot of this is a continuation of the protests that took place in 2023, pre-October the 7th, over the judicial quote-unquote reforms that Netanyahu was pushing, the coup, uh, to make himself kind of less accountable to the judiciary. A lot of those protesters are back now calling for a hostage deal. The common thread between those protests and these are hatred for Netanyahu. Clearly, he's a, a loathed politician by many in Israel. Do you see a, a, a kind of dissonance, a disconnect, between how Netanyahu's covered in Israel, how he's protested against in Israel, how the hostages' families hate him in Israel, and how in the United States he's still embraced by the ruling class, he's still embraced by the media, softball interviews, and in fact, no one really challenges him on the fact that the hostages he claims to be fighting for, their families are against him. Yes, absolutely. There is such a disconnect. Look, inside Israel, uh, the vast majority of Israelis do not support him. And we see this not just in the numbers of people who are coming out weekly um, to these protests, but in the ways in which they speak about him. And so he's a very unpopular prime minister. He was unpopular before October, and he remains uh, deeply unpopular. And at the same time, I think there now is a reckoning that that the reason that Netanyahu remains and the reason the reason that they're continuing this genocide is because they know that once Israel stops that there will be attempts to go after him not for genocide but for all of the corruption so yes he's he's deeply unpopular and yet you don't see that coming across in the United States is quite the opposite where where he he gets a standing ovations inside congress um, and, and rounds of applause, so many that I stopped counting. Yeah, he gets a free hand, and as a result, we have the killing in Gaza continuing as we approach the one-year anniversary of what happened on October 7th, of those attacks on October 7th. I don't think any of us imagined it would still be going on like this. A year later, we have the attacks in Mawasi this week, so-called safe zone, uh, at least 19 Palestinians killed, another 60 injured. And not just a free hand in Gaza, of course, Diana, but as some of us predicted, this would spread, and we now have this escalating violence in the occupied West Bank. Um, raids, detentions, the killing of an American protester last week in the West Bank. Um, is that because Netanyahu thinks, A, this is a time to get away with it? Is this Ben Gavir in his government and Smotrich thinking this is a moment to expand the settlements, fed accompli, facts on the ground? What's driving, do you think, what's happening in the West Bank? That's a great question, Mahdi. You know, in Israel, there's long been a debate about who calls the shots. Is it mm. the United States or is it Israel? And and what Netanyahu and Ben Gvir are all about is showing the United States that they're the ones who are calling the shots. So they're going to continue because because this government, the the Biden administration, has given them a free hand, and they're hoping uh, that Trump will be elected so that they can do whatever it is that they want to do. So when you see that that you've got a government that has made it clear that they want to get rid of Palestinians and, and that, in fact, they are doing their best to get rid of Palestinians in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, and nobody stopping them, then, of course, they're going to try to drag it out as far as possible until they get the president of their choice, who has already said that Netanyahu should, quote, unquote, finish the job. So I want to come back to Trump in one moment. Just on Biden, before we move on to Trump, 
Uh, I'm not sure if you saw the statement he put out um, yesterday. Uh, the written statement was pretty bad. The verbal statement was even worse when he said to reporters, oh, I think apparently it was a ricochet. It hit the ground and accidentally killed an American citizen in the West Bank. That's the President of the United States, A, uncritically accepting the Israeli line. In fact, going beyond the Israeli line, even the Israelis didn't say it was a ricochet. They said that a sniper shot her thinking she was a threat, which she wasn't. It was an accident in that way. He seems to have gone even beyond Israel. Um, this is a man who was famous for his empathy, but simply cannot ever empathize with one group of people. And, and obviously, not just one group of people, because this was a Turkish-American citizen, not a Palestinian, but cannot empathize with anyone killed by Israel, clearly. Absolutely. And we've seen this time and again. You know, when when my friend, um, former uh, journalist Shirin Abu Akhli, was killed, we saw the same yep. accepting of Israeli lines day after day after day. And, and, and lack of empathy towards any Palestinian life. And here's the problem, Mahdi. It's not just that he's, he's providing cover and saying that, that there was this ricochet or whatever it was, but that nobody's questioning why is it that Israel's allowed to use live weaponry, live ammunition on Palestinians who are simply trying to access their land? This is the fundamental question, and yet he never answers yep. that. He just gives Israel a pass. Even their excuse, the Israeli military, is that these people were throwing stones, allegedly. I mean, he was 200 meters away, this sniper. There's no scenario in which a stone was a threat to him. Um, let me ask you this. Did you watch any of the presidential debate? Did you see the exchange on Gaza, which came very late? I say on Gaza. It wasn't really about Gaza because they made it into a competition between Harris and Trump as to who loves Israel more. That's the pro exactly the problem. In addition to repeating all of these now debunked claims, it was a question of, who loves Israel more? And it's become clear that the vast majority of Americans want to see a ceasefire. This is what polling is telling us. And yet we have these two candidates who are falling over themselves to, to prove that they have better Israel credentials. You know, this, this, is, this is the tragedy, is that we cannot, as Palestinians, look to the United States yeah. to be providing a, a free hand, uh, to be providing any level of honest brokering or, or otherwise. They're simply not honest or fair. They're not honest or fair. Neither party are when it comes to uh, the occupied territories. But let me ask you a difficult, uh, contentious question right now here in the US amongst Arab American, Muslim American communities who are going to vote. You mentioned a moment ago that Ben Gavir and Smotrich are waiting for Trump, and I think that's undeniable. I think Ben Gavir has said, is Trump will give us the free hand that Biden doesn't. Uh, other ministers, the, um, the Minister for Diaspora Affairs has said, I want Trump, not Biden. Multiple senior Israelis, Netanyahu clearly uh, wants Trump. Question yeah. then, is it fair to say then that if Donald Trump were elected president, he would be even worse on Gaza than Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who have been awful? I think that all of them are going to be awful on Gaza. I think that we do a disservice if we somehow say that that um, that uh, that Trump is is going to be better because he's he's clearly not, and it's important for us to look at the track record that that Trump had. He's the man who set into place and made it easy and possible for Israel to go after UNRWA. We and we see that that what the Biden administration did was simply pick up on all of those policies. Yeah. I've yet to hear President Biden calling for, a, you know, pushing for a ceasefire, and he has it within his capability to do so. And similarly, similarly Kamala Harris has, um, has not been forceful. So for Palestinians, we know that whether it's Republican or a Democrat, that uh, the policies are going to continue. And, and this is why it's so disheartening for people. It is disheartening, and it's frustrating to see uh, Democrats say stuff like, but we're working on a ceasefire, as if they're no. powerless bystanders, not the people who are arming uh, the genocidal army. Diana Boudou, we will have to leave it there. Thank you so much, as ever, for your analysis you. and for all your pieces for Zetea. We appreciate you as a columnist. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks. Thank you. That's our show. May the Unfiltered will be back next week. In the meantime, do make sure you subscribe to Zetea. Go to zetea.com. For now, from me, goodbye. Did you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and turn on notifications. For exclusive content and to support our independent, unfiltered journalism, head over to zateo.com. Your support matters.